All right, how's it going, y'all? So I'm about to go through and redo my entire network setup. I'm gonna reassign all the IP addresses and really change the entire structure of how I've done everything. It is going to be a long process and it's taking a lot of planning and this video is really gonna talk about why I'm doing it and kind of how I'm planning it out and it's really gonna be a home lab episode. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. So right now, my network is all on the 10.0.0.0 slash 16 subnet. So pretty much any IP addresses from 10.0.0.0 to 10.0.255.255 are in play on my network. And so that was easy, so I could kind of go through and statically assign stuff, but I really never planned it out super well. I did to a degree, I did a better job. I used to be on 192.168, and that was a subnet that I was using, and I switched over that because I really liked the idea of using 10, because it was less characters and would be faster to type. And so when I moved, I actually went through and changed it. So pretty much all of my IP addresses right now are 10.0.0. whatever. And so while I did have some structure when I was playing IP addresses, every single time I needed a new IP address for a different service, I just kind of picked one at random and I was like, okay, well that makes sense for this and things like that. And it really never made a ton of sense. And it also kind of got annoying and I really have trouble remembering things. The other and by far the biggest reason why I'm going to go through and redo everything are VPN connections. So when you're setting up your own self-hosted VPN server, like I often do to access things behind a firewall, you actually have a little bit of a trouble whenever a specific instance occurs. And that instance is where whatever local subnet you're on, so wherever the client's remote device is, whatever that subnet is, actually takes precedence over whatever the IP address is that it's trying to access on the VPN server. Now there are ways around this, but it takes a lot of configuration on the client side and just adds a whole layer of complexity onto it. And so say I was at a coffee shop and I wanted to access securely all my services back home on my laptop. So if the coffee shop used the subnet 10.0.0.0, I was out of luck because it would not successfully route my connection to 10.0.0.123, whatever, to add my home network because that IP address, that subnet, took precedence at the local coffee shop. And it just caused a lot of issues with that. And so what I found is, and what I'd really recommend everybody do, is go through and actually pick a very arbitrary subnet to choose. So my main subnet, and I've got it right here, is going to be 10.30. That is going to be my main one. And then I'm gonna have a couple of different options here. So it's 10.30, 10.31, and 10.32. And I'm gonna to get to that in a minute why there are three different versions of them because they're all going to pretty much mirror each other. And so by having this, it's going to be incredibly unlikely that whatever coffee shop you go to also happens to be using the 10.30 subnet. That would be really wild, right? And so by far the vast majority of IP addresses that you're going to encounter in the wild are going to be either in the 192.168.0 or one subnet or the 10.0.0 one or zero subnet. So those two are by far going to be the, I'd say 99% of the stuff you're just gonna run into in the wild and things that are gonna have a free Wi-Fi because they're probably not gonna have free Wi-Fi if they've really set up their corporate network super well and it's really unlikely it's gonna run into that. So that should alleviate so many of my issues. The other thing I really wanna do, and as you can see right behind me, is I went through and I bought a used computer off of Craigslist. And so this computer has 48 gigs of RAM and I'm probably gonna upgrade it to 64. And it's going to be a standalone virtualization server. And I'm gonna be installing XCPNG on it with Zen Orchestra on top of it to manage the entire thing. And that should be so much better and let me have so much more flexibility when it comes to virtualization. Both Synology and TrueNAS, both my NASes, have the ability to have virtual machines. And I actually really like Synology's virtual machine manager but the thing is, Synologies just do not have that much power. Then when it comes to Beehive, which is what FreeNAS slash TrueNAS use, it's just not that great of a virtualization host, and it just runs into issues, and it's clunky, and there's a lot of things like that that I'm trying to get off of. Instead, I'm going to a straight-up hypervisor that is designed to run virtual machines first and primary. And so that's gonna be this server right here, and so I'm gonna have a ton of services able to be run on there, and it's going to be a lot better. And so I'm figuring while I'm doing this, I'm going to go through and set everything up properly the first time, and so I'll be able to migrate these virtual machines between any other XCPNG instance. So that means that, okay, say I upgrade to a new server, I'm now just gonna be able to migrate them, 
And that way I'm not going to be stuck into the ecosystem of having to rely on TrueNAS for my virtual machines or having to rely on Synology for my virtual machines. Though I still definitely am going to be running virtual machines out of Synology and possibly even TrueNAS because I'm going to have those as backup plans pretty much for certain services. So this right here is the network I'm planning out. And as you can see, it is quite complex and is going to have quite a few VLANs and separate networks. So the ones right here to the left are the basic mapping. Those are all of the different specific LANs that I'm going to have. So my primary that most computers are going to be on is going to be 10.30.0.0 slash 16. And so pretty much what that means is I can vary either one of these two last digits from zero to 255. And that's how many IP addresses I can have on there. And so that's going to be my primary one. And then I'm also going to have identical networks for 31 and 32. And the reason I'm going to have that is I'm pretty much for anything that's storage related, I'm going to have multiple options on how to get there. This will allow for my NASs and other things to communicate on separate networks. And so that way I don't have to deal with link aggregation, slowing things down. Instead, I can just have direct connections for things like backups and things like that, that are on their own subnet. Then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be using NFS. And so NFS, unless you've got a very complex setup that I'm just not ready for, it's very hard to do authentication on. And so instead, what you do is you pretty much just say, okay, anybody on this IP address, normally you give it one IP address, is good. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and say, okay, anybody who's on this VLAN, and so it is going to be protected by a VLAN, so regular clients just won't be able to get to it unless I've given them access to, will have trusted access to get to that. And so those are the three different options. And so anytime I've got a NAS IP address, that's 10.30.1.50, whatever, I'm also going to have that exact same NAS have an IP address 10.31.1.50. So that way they mirror each other and it's just easier to remember everything. It is a huge waste of IP addresses, but it doesn't matter because those are not in use at all. So one other thing you might see often is that people say having a slash 16 subnet is too big, it's gonna cause issues. Really, that's whenever you're dealing in a corporate environment where you actually have the thousands of devices on a network and you can start having issues there. In reality, I'm not gonna have that many devices and I'm just using this huge subnet so I can organize things out. And so those are gonna be the first three right here. And then down here, we're going to have a site site VPN and I'm gonna be able to set up a few of those. And so that way, if I wanna have another site, maybe in my parents' house where I wanna have a secure connection to it, very easy, a direct connection, that will be on this subnet and I can have multiple of those, say I want four or five houses, all with a secure connection, I can do that, and they'll basically just iterate on this digit right here. Then I'm also going to have two different options for VPN planning. Uh, it's probably overkill. What I'm probably gonna do is WireGuard as well as OpenVPN, and for some devices, I might even add a third in here for C and have it, the ability to run uh, L2TP over IPsec, just because some devices, that's the only VPN connection you can go with. Then the final current network that I've got for devices that are kind of trusted, devices that I actually expect to have and that I'm not too worried about taking over things, is going to be direct connections. So that way, anytime I'm setting up a subnet where I'm directly connecting two machines with static IP addresses over a cable that just connects the two of them for efficiency and things like that, that will use those IP addresses. The reason I've got that is it's really just to make sure I never accidentally have two of those on the same box that conflict and cause any weird issues. Then if we go down, we've got the untrusted networks. And what I've done here is you can see I've gone from the 10 subnet to the 192.168 subnet for all of these. And this way, if I'm ever looking at IP addresses, I can just really easily tell, hey, this is not my device or this is device I think could cause issues or anything like that. And I really don't have to go, hey, what is that? And kind of sort through, it's just a really easy indication. Okay, it starts with 192. That means it's gotta be a somewhat untrusted device. And so I'm going to have a security camera VLAN right here. Then I'm also going to have an IoT things. I'm not really sure what I'm gonna put in there quite yet because a lot of the things I have with IoT, basically internet of things, things that you don't necessarily trust that you wanna have analytics for, I like them to be able to talk to other devices, things like Apple TVs, things like Amazon Alexas. You wanna be able to push stuff from your phone 
And these devices very rarely work well when they're on two different subnets. Even if they've got the proper setups in place where they're allowed to talk to each other, they still don't tend to work together. So I'm gonna see if I end up with any of those, maybe like a temperature sensor, things like that. But that, that's gonna be there just for future planning. And then also a guest network, just easier, throw everybody on a guest network and that way you don't have to worry about as much. All right, and so now we're going to go over here and this is going to be the actual IP addresses and services that I'm setting up and planning out for. So this is that 10.30 domain that I've got. And so I've got a bunch of different stuff here. So the 10.30.0 domain is pretty much all going to be for computers. They're all gonna be DHCP. And I might even remove this and stick this on its own subnet. So everything in 10.30.0.0 slash 24 are all just going to be set up by DHCP, super easy, super basic. And then from there, the next 10.30.1.0 slash 24, I'm going to have a ton of actual servers and specifically things that need redundancy. And it's all going to be things like DHCP, DNS, all of those things you want to have multiple instances of because if you're running your own DNS server at home and DNS fails, all of a sudden your entire network breaks and your fiance is going to get very mad at you. So I'm going to make sure that I've got redundancy on there and things like that. And then I might also go into Active Directory. I'm thinking about setting up a Samba Active Directory server, but I think that might be overkill and that might just be for future planning, but I've left that in there. And then also for file servers are going to have their own. And then finally right here, we're down to our virtual machine hosts. So XCPNG is the operating system that I'm gonna be using that sets up all the virtual machines. So it is a hypervisor that is really good at having a ton of virtual machines. And I'm gonna be able to run a lot of them as long as I have enough RAM because they're not going to be too intensive of tasks. And so I've set up 20 IP addresses here just so it'll make sure to have as many servers as I want on there and I can add them as go. So say I add three more on there, it'll be VM01, VM02, VM03 and that way I'll be able to resolve them. So if you look in this column right here, this is the local domain. These are the DNS addresses that every single one of these services is going to be getting. And I'm going to be using what's called a search domain. And so now I will not have to do something like type dns01.sr.spacerex.co into an address bar. Instead, since I've got this set up as a search domain, pretty much any domain that I set up that does not have a dot something at the end. So say I just type in DNS01 slash, that will tell my computer, oh, okay, just append that with dot sr.spacerex.co. So I will just have to type in this right here into my browser, into terminal, into anything, and it will directly associate with that IP address. And so that is going to be a lot easier than typing out a ton of stuff. And that's actually one of the reasons I'm doing this. The other thing is, as you can see, I've got this .sr, .spacerex.co. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm going to go through and say, okay, all the local stuff is in the .sr domain. So that means that I own the domain .spacerex.co. And then as a subdomain of that, there's .sr. And so that is going to be all the local assets are going to be part of that. And that will help a ton if I do set up Active Directory. And so that will also help in the case where I don't have to go through and update my local DNS server as well as my global DNS server, the actual DNS server that you get when you say, hey, let's go to www.spacerex.co. I will not have to update the internal version of that because it's not the official domain for that. Instead, it will just be forwarded on. And so these are just a lot of mistakes I've learned. I'm definitely gonna go through and do a DNS video about my entire planning for this because it's really important of a service to get right and I got it wrong at first. And so that's what all of these columns are. And then finally, the servers I've got that I'm gonna have multiple instances of, and this is just current, I've still got a ton of options here, are gonna be the Zen Orchestra instances. So I'm planning on having a couple of different options for the Zen Orchestra instances, because I don't want the case where my virtual machine host is not booting. And now, okay, I can't even tell if Zen Orchestra isn't communicating or anything like that. So for those of you who don't know, Zen Orchestra is the management platform that you wanna use with XCPNG. So XCPNG is a hypervisor that you just interface with with Terminal. Or you install a virtual machine on there that is this thing called Zen Orchestra that has that nice pretty web interface that makes everything super easy to use. And so if a virtual machine on that host does not boot, which would be Zen Orchestra, 
I don't know if there's a problem with the host or what's going on. And so I wanna have that virtual machine running probably on my Synology as a backup plan. And so if I do break anything, I can fix it using the Synology virtual machine of Zen Orchestra, which will communicate with a pool. I know that's a bit confusing. I'm gonna have some videos on Zen Orchestra and my entire setup for that, but that's why I have multiple instances of this Zen Orchestra. Now, next up, we've got the different services that I'm gonna be running, and I'm going to be running a ton. It is going to be entirely unnecessary to have all of these things. I'm not using Docker. I could use Docker, but I really just want to have all of these things as different virtual machines because in my experience, it's a lot easier to segregate off services and be able to reset them one by one and take them down one by one than having these massive Docker containers. And it's just going to make backing everything up so much easier because I'll have the ability to back up every single one of these virtual machines on its own. The biggest downside you get by running every single one of these instances as a virtual machine and not as a Docker container on a single virtual machine is really coming down to RAM. So the processor is a little bit more of an overhead, but it's not nearly as much as RAM. Basically, I'll have to allocate an extra 500 megabytes of RAM probably per virtual machine just to run the operating system than I would if I had them all running as a Docker container under a single host. But for me, that's okay because as I said, I've got a ton of RAM in here and I like having everything segregated off. And so these are all going to be the different services that I'm running and I'm definitely gonna have more as it goes along, but that's what I've started with. Then down here, I've got different hardware. So those are gonna be things like Wi-Fi routers, switches, everything like that will go under hardware. And then the testing one where I'm just throwing something together will be under there. And so that is overall my plan and why I'm going to be doing it. And then I did want to touch on probably the most important thing that I've got to do, and that is DNS. So right now I've not actually got DHCP set up. I'm probably going to be setting up DHCP just still on the router. I'd like to move it off at one point but it's really just not gonna be worth it for me right now because it does add so much of an issue. But since I am going to be hosting my own DNS servers, if they go down, the network pretty much goes down and there's so many issues related to that. And so what I'm gonna be doing with DNS is I'm actually probably going to be allocating it three different places. So since it's crucial, it's going to have its own hardware one. So I'm gonna set up on a Raspberry Pi, then I'm gonna set up as a virtual machine on the actual XCPNG virtual host that I've got. And then I'm also going to set up as a virtual machine on my Synology. And so the reason I have three different instances across three different pieces of hardware is I'm using everything with DNS. So the problem with that is, say the server shuts down and needs a DNS address to reboot. Say it's using a DNS address to figure out where its storage is, a very normal use case. Well, if the DNS server can't boot because it needs a DNS server to figure out where its storage is, that's not gonna work. And so that's why I'm gonna make sure it's also on the Synology and the Synology will be able to boot totally on its own. It'll figure itself out. And it will also be on a hardware Raspberry Pi. And so that way it will always be running. I will have three different redundancies. I might even go for four just because DNS is such an important service. I really do not want one thing to be able to take down my entire network. And if you're running a DNS server and it is the primary DNS server, that can happen. There is still also a real chance that I go through and add the Google DNS server, which is 8.8.8.8 as my fourth DNS entry, just because it would lower the risk significantly in case everything failed. And I think it shouldn't cause any issues, but I am still considering that out. Either way, having DNS servers running locally, especially as I get more clients, will help things speed up quite a bit because if people are querying the exact same DNS entry, it will all be cached locally, which is nice. And so instead of having to go to Google and back, it will just have to go locally to the DNS server and instantly send it back because it will already have it in its cache, most likely. All right, and so that is the overview of my network planning. As you can see, I'm going to have quite a few videos in all of these things. But let me know any other tutorials you'd like me to make, especially with different services like this, and what kind of videos you'd like to see from a home lab perspective. And have a good one. Bye.